report in the township office, sent to the Courier News, the Echo Sentinel, and tapped into Warren, and filed with the township clerk of the Township of Warren, all in accordance with the requirements of the Open Public Meetings Act. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, All right, I will now call the roll. Mr. Bellish. Mr. Ishii. Here. Mrs. Breezy. Here. Mrs. Clark. Here. Mrs. DiMaggio. Ms. Keller. Here. Mr. Weinstein. Here. Mrs. Zahn. Here. And Mr. Franco. Here. They have a quorum. Resolved that the Board of Education approved the public session minutes of the October 25th, 2021 board meeting. Second. Yes. Mr. Dishi? Yes. Mr. Breezy? Yes. Mrs. Clark? Yes. Ms. Keller? Yes. Mr. Weinstein? Yes. Mrs. Zahn? Yes. And Mr. Franco? Yes. Uh, correspondence and information. Yes, the board's in receipt of one email on a return to school topic, and there was one HIV investigation at Warren Middle School that was confirmed HIV. That's it for that section. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mingle. Welcome everyone on this crisp, uh, Thanksgiving week. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Thanksgiving week meeting. Uh, it's nice to see a room full of people here, actually. Our, our undefeated uh, middle school soccer team is here, so a big congratulations. doing a slight presentation for them in a moment. Uh, also would like to welcome the three incoming board members, uh, Mr. Desai, Mr. Croson, and Mr. Valentino, who are joining us here as well. Congratulations on your victories. And I hope everyone uh, has a great Thanksgiving this week. Don't eat too much. Hope you get to spend some time with your family and friends and, and, uh, and just stay safe this week. So, uh, with that said, Mr. Villar, I will pass to you. Just take one of these. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you to Dr. Mingle, the members of the board, for hosting us this evening. I'm George Villar. I'm the principal of Warren Middle School. Um, I'm actually thrilled tonight to be here to recognize our boys' soccer team and their championship season. You know, there are professional athletes who go their entire career and never win a championship. So it's something that should never be overlooked and never taken for granted. When it comes to you, it's an accolade that you should celebrate and be very thankful of. And especially with the team. These are the, the young men who are with you in the hallways. They, they live in your neighborhood. You grew up with them. So to, to bring that home and to, to earn a championship, there was a, a honor tonight um, to not only recognize the team for their, their championship win, but also that it was an undefeated season. And I think Mr. Haney shared with me only two goals scored on the whole entire season. So tremendous accomplishment. If you were there for the championship game, it was an absolute nail biter that came down seven penalty kicks before it was resolved. So it seemed to hang in the balance and actually uh, it was against us at the very start and then back to us at the end. So to see uh, the community up the field and um, celebrate with the end, it was absolutely fantastic. So congratulations to them. Gentlemen. Yeah. I'm gonna call you each up and uh, give a certificate if I could ask Coach Ohini to come up here with me and help me out with that. Uh, and one of our captains, that he's, gonna be, uh, the, he's number one here, Antonio Giuliano. Come on up. You could have brought the trophy with you. <laughs> and by the way, thank you very much for, for your support with resources uh, to allow this to happen year after year. Uh, couldn't do it without you. So Dr. Mingle, Mr. Franco, and fellow board members, thank you very much for all that you do to make this possible. And Mr. Villar. It's a pleasure. You. 
Another is co-captain Logan Pimentel. You had our three captains in the front. Did you know that? <laughs> Gabriel Abreu. Okay. Evan Balarchik. Uh, our superior goalie, Matthew Dubois. Our creator of many midfield acrobats, J.P. Fernandez. Evan Goncalves. Dylan Gelato. Finn Byrne. Ryan Mitra. And our only sixth grader on the team played a very <laughs> integral part in our season, Matthew Machado. Uh, one of our stars for next year, Cesar Miranda. Charles is not here, I don't think. Charles Mayer, no, no. Omar Mahalam. Never gets tired. Runs a 530 mile biscuit. Uh, Wilson Perry, a leader for next year. And one of our inspirations for winning down the stretch, Alexios uh, Prisipolis, who got injured. The rest of the team picked it up. And one of our key defenders was injured here. Aiden Sarcevic, not here. Um, Jesse Shapiro, not here. Uh, Calvin Zhao, who kept it light and interesting with his. Corky, <laughs> Corky. So, thank you to Coach Eni for bringing this home this season. <laughs> this is where they give me uh, you're welcome to stay. <laughs> 
Uh, hopefully soon we can take pictures like that and see everyone's faces. Uh, call Governor Murphy. <laughs> Let him know. So we're going to move on with uh, with uh, board meet, uh, board uh, business. If you are welcome to stay, however, this would be a good opportunity if you don't wish to be here to find the exit. <laughs> Mr. Riegler, we'll be going to Mr. Villar's presentation next. Uh, wherever you're comfortable, it's fine, actually. Because you can use the wireless mic, so you can take this back. Sorry, I know it's uh, not the most. It's okay. We'll to go after this, right? <laughs> Here? Well, <laughs> oh, change management process, right? right. right. <laughs> Scintillating talk, right? <laughs> Okay, so we're going to move on to an follow equally exciting game. topic <laughs> as an undefeated soccer season. All right, yeah, probably follow with, that, right? We're going to stay with Mr. Villar, and, and he's got a presentation for us on the change management process overview. Mr. Villar. It's like uh, being at Woodstock and going after the who or something like that, right? Like, like, Whoa, right. All right, so uh, thank you for having me this evening. I'm, I'm proud of the work that we've done on the Strategic Planning Committee. Goal number two, change management process. Something that was started uh, several years ago as part of this plan. Um, the, we heard very loud and clear during the process when the community shared their thoughts with us that one of the things they desired was as we identify areas of need and projects that there be some uniformity to the way we go about um, discussing those and making decisions about those and that they should be transparent and that should have stakeholder involvement throughout. So one of the tasks then, or the goal became to organize that, right? To create some kind or identify uh, an existing process or create one of our own that we could say, this is the model. This is the, the, the blueprint that we will use in the coming years, anytime we are identifying a need and addressing those needs. So tonight I get to uh, present to you the conclusion of our findings here. Uh, I would like to, to start by identifying uh, the work of Melissa Smolinski, Jill Andrews, Kristen Stolino, Keller and of course Dr. Mingle who all contributed to the discussions, the resources, the creativity, and ultimately the agreement as to what that process should look like. Uh, one thing we actually learned is that all change management processes have a nice name. Uh, we kept coming back to the Lewin and the ADCAR, so we decided, you know what, let's create a name of our own. So we called it the WISE, right? the Warren Initiative for Strategic Empowerment, right? Uh, so a nice talking point, because you could very easily say, well, have you used the WISE model, right, to address this decision? And you have something sort of very tangible to, to hang on to right there. As we looked at different models and educated ourselves on the process of change management, uh, there were certain elements that stood out to us in, in various models that we saw when we looked at, um, that they created an organization that was reliable and people would understood, um, that it raised awareness, right? That it pulled people toward it and, and gathered information uh, about what they wanted uh, within the change, um, that it encouraged buy-in on the, the, the back end of it, that as the decisions were made and recommendations, recommendations were adopted, you would say, yes, these are the things that are gonna have a, a long-term sustainability about them. And that lastly, that they were measurable, that you could put targets to them and say, did we accomplish this, right, you know, through this process? And really what we had decided on is um, we realized that we've been working with the change management model these past couple of years in the return to school plan. So we took that as our basis and reconfigured it along with some other elements from different other models that we like very much uh, to create. This is the, the basic structure of what we're talking about here. Uh, we actually start in the upper left-hand corner with an identified need that then gets uh, presented to a steering committee, some group of people from the district, whether it be administrators, teachers, parents, right, uh, who would ultimately be responsible for seeing through the recommendation process about how to address a need that is out there. Uh, the idea is that, right, we move in a sort of circular pattern as we did in the, re the return to school committee. Uh, that steering committee, who is uh, the responsible stakeholders, um, begin by asking questions about what should the goals be. And, and one of the things that uh, we think it's important whenever we go through this process is be, uh, to begin with a, a blank slate, to ask the question, in the ideal, 
what would be the outcome we arrive at? What would be the best solution for the students of the Warren Township schools? And to let that guide you in your goal setting process. Uh, I actually put a, the model to the test this past fall when organizing uh, eighth grade field trip, which is something that's gonna be coming to you soon. Um, and we started with the very question, should we even have a field trip? And when the answer came back from the stakeholders is yes, then the second question was, what should that trip look like? Should it be something like we've done in the past or should it be something different than that? And we were actually surprised because we let the stakeholders guide us in those decisions. And we think that's, that's a really important part of this process. And that's how you see as, as you gather around the sort of back end of the curve there, right? In terms of how you're gathering the information to you to inform you about the direction that you should go. And of course, finally, the steering committee would then organize the recommendations and hand it off to whoever is the, the next in the chain of command. Uh, we, we organized here, um, a way of understanding where do you go next once you have your recommendations in place, who are you turning to and at what level you know, should you be addressing the various aspects of identified needs. Um, I think of some of the, in my five years, projects that I've been presented with, such as uh, when I very first started with the district, the uh, middle school schedule, right? And we followed a process that was similar to this, right? In terms of one of those kinds of projects we addressed, um, the opening of the fitness center, all examples of things that we've done that could have come through a, a process like this. All right, so among the, the many things that the steering committee has to do, we, we wanted to make sure that we enumerated uh, their, their responsibilities. Um, important in that is identifying uh, who holds the majority of the decision-making power, right? Is this a, a steering committee of consensus or is one person on the committee going to say, you're informing me of what should happen here and then I will make the recommendations from there. It's, it's a critical step in what happens because I think it identifies um, who gets to have what kind of say, right? With, within the recommendation that ultimately comes out. Another critical step is making sure that they identify all the how-tos, right? You, you get the big picture in the recommendation, but you should also lay out all those steps along the way to say, you know, how are we gonna achieve the timeline that we're laying out and make sure it's done in, in a reasonable kind of way. And then lastly, and this is super important that the last item on the list is making sure there's a plan for communication so that anyone who's impacted by any recommendation being made is well informed in advance of that happening and, and has had some input there. And then as part of the goal setting process, right? Not only um, setting the goals, but also really important that last step that's on that list, making sure that you identify the success matrix and, and how you're going to say, did we accomplish what we set out to do or are we falling short? And if so, why? And what changes can we make in that process? And then steps to gathering data, of course, um, not only identifying the problem and, and what are the elements there, but to be transparent through that process so it doesn't look like you know you're sharing all the data and, and making sure that uh, everyone is aware of what the, the total problem looks like and maybe you know you might be looking at it from a certain perspective but understanding that um depending where you're at within the problem could change how you, you you see what's going on this was interesting the, the stakeholder input and some of the items that are here two years ago some of the things that are on this list like surveys and pulse checks they were very alien to us and they almost seemed a little daunting. Of course, after the pandemic, we we're like steeped in these now. We understand these very intimately. And now we say, you know, it, it seems um, almost logical that of course, when going through any kind of process, you would include these types of items in, in a way to gather data and make sure that you're, you're connecting with all the constituent populations. But we just wanted a nice thorough list to say, all of these are options for you as you go through any kind of. And then once that's done, where do you go from there? Is, is the, the person you're making the recommendation to the building principal? Is it some district level official, right? Where to next step? Make sure you have a plan for implementation. And we talked, I said uh, about this earlier, uh, that the, all the how-tos that go into making sure that plan reaches its identity. Lastly, how do you measure that? How do you make sure that what you set out to do is accomplished? And it's happening. So, um, one of the items uh, I'm not going to be able to do it there that accompanies our document is also a, a template that anyone could literally just pull out of a binder and say, "Okay, I have I've been presented with this project, with this task, with this question. Where do I start?" And it organizes that way because I've always found that when you don't have to create the process while you're in it, you can just focus on the question itself. Much more productive, you know, throughout that. And that's what we wanted to make sure that we're handing off to anybody who would be facing any district level concern, a way to just say, okay, where do I start? Who do I bring to me to help organize this? And how do we bring it to a logical conclusion? Oh, 
Okay. Thank you, Mr. Below. <laughs> see, how do you follow? Just the hoop, see right? the same. You got the same reaction as the soccer team. That's amazing. <laughs> Uh, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Millar before we move on? Mr. Bishi. Uh, just to get a, a general sense for it. That was very good, by the way, and I like how you involve people, you know, and who do you go to. Um, what's the gut feel? Like, how often do we use this uh, in a year or something like it? Will we use it like 10 times a year, 20 times a year, two times a year? Like, I'm wondering how many times you take the book off the shelf, like you were mentioning. Okay, so what's your gut feel? So if I can jump, yeah. So right now we're it's already in process on at least three or four things right. so we tested it on on middle school field trips uh we're using it for starting to set up the process for determining what lunch will look like next school year mm -hmm. uh one that i haven't brought to the board yet but i'll mention uh here is uh i'd like to bring a recommendation around substitute pay at the next meeting so we're using this process for that as well and the whole planning for elementary growth process is built yeah. on it too so the idea is it can be uh, expanded or shrunk regard, regardless of the size of the problem. So a building principal could use it for something in their own building, or we can use it for a district. The idea is that when something comes to you for, with a recommendation, you know that we've gone through this process and you can sort of see the steps along the way for any major issue that has to be decided. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Blah. Thank you, Mr. Blah. Okay, we're going to move on now to the iReady data overview. Mr. Tam, who I believe is ready on Zoom for us, has been waiting patiently. Thank you, Mr. Tam. Oh, no worries. Hopefully everyone can see my screen and you can hear me okay? Yes, yes, we do. Perfect. So, hey, um, thank you for inviting me to present to you. I know, um, I think Mr. Kimmick has presented some information to you previously. And one of the questions that you had for him was to provide a broader perspective of what does that look like in terms of diagnostic performance across the country and within the state of New Jersey. So that's gonna be the bulk of my presentation today. Um, so we're gonna talk about what math first. Um, and what you're seeing on the screen is the comparison of how students did in terms of the readiness for on grade level instruction and showing you what percentage of students are emerging on or above grade level across the United States, within the state of New Jersey and within the district. So what I'm showing you is what it was historically. So the school year 2021 and this school year. So anything that's in gray represents historical or past year. Anything in green represents this fall. And then um, I know that some of you are really interested in looking at the numbers. So what question I always get, get is what's significant? So anything, any time that the numbers are in a box of blue, not significant, they're always going to get annual, like year to year fluctuation. So if you had a change of minus four, it's not the end of the world. Right? However, a minus six change is pretty significant. Uh, minus six, seven, and what you're seeing here across the board is what percentage of students are emerging on or grade level or above grade level this fall compared to past years across the country. So I think I would say that you probably read a lot of stories about students with unfinished learning. And as you can tell, it's most significant in grades five, six, seven, and eight, and nine. Um, and that's what we wanted to share. Um, I know that it's not just about looking at the nation. Um, so within, across the country, we work with about 10 million students. In the state of New Jersey, we work with about 175,000. So the data that you're seeing right now represents the fall um, and historical performance of those students where we were able to have historical records. So your data is somewhat mixed up in here, but wanted to share with you um, how the state is performing. So once again, first grade, similar amount of decline as compared to other states, but uh, the rest of the country. But I think there's definitely um, some you know, some things to consider when it comes to Warren um, and how you're doing relatively well compared to the district, and, the state and the nation. If anything, what I would just highlight and congratulate you on is middle school. So maybe that's why the, the, the boys are doing so well in soccer, but they actually <laughs> improved, right? Um, this fall compared to past years, when everyone's down, they're up. So I'm gonna give you a moment to take a look at the data and just see if there's any questions. And then I'll share what reading looks like 
and look at what the data from a different perspective in just a moment. Yes. Uh, so so we're, we, you've gone through the first three slides, right? The first three slides, the bar charts? That's correct. Okay. It just, uh, I don't understand. The, the red boxes represent what the negatives in, let's say, the first slide. What are those negative six? Negative so six? so the, red, the red boxes represent significance, meaning if, I were to, if, if the scores were down four or five points or less than five, I put it in the blue box, right? And I didn't notice the math error here. Um, but when it's when we're talking about six six percentage point differences, fifth, negative fifteen, negative fifteen, negative sixteen, like that's a big deal. Okay, Meaning so three is, quarters yeah. of the students in fifth grade started the year emerging on or above, and now it's only fifty nine percent in the state of New Jersey. So uh, what does the negative fifteen, negative sixteen, negative sixteen? Negative that's all state level. That's what does that state numbers? Oh, those are those not our numbers. No. None of these are our numbers. So what he's doing, we compared to the state numbers, these numbers that he's showing now on the presentation or the state change from year to year. Okay. And then what he did was he showed us where the district is and those numbers, if you go, he'll show you them now. These oh, are the district okay. numbers as compared to what those state numbers are. So the blue boxes are uh, Warren Township numbers. Well, no, the blue box means that there's not much significance in the change. The red means that there was a significant change. Okay. The blue is indicative of the significance of the change. So it's got nothing to do with whose data it is. Slide three of three is Warren, is that right? That's correct. This got is it, got it. Thank you. Sorry for that. I just want to make sure I'm no following. Okay. Yeah, it takes a while to get um, oriented around the data. But yeah, so it, it is you know, key to note that they're always going to have some change from year to year. And then the question is, is you know, having a minus five change significant? And it's not, it is um, not that significant given the pandemic. And when you compare that to a negative 15 change across um, the state, a, a minus five is actually a pretty good thing to be. The next set of data I'm gonna share with you is looking at it from a different perspective. So we looked at who's ready for grade level instruction, meaning they are emerging um, on or above grade level. These are the students who are definitely not ready. So these are the kids who are two or more grade levels below across the United States. Um, and this year, we see an increase of two percentage points. So once again, you're always going to get the fluctuation, and that's why I put the, the plus two in a, in a box of that's blue in color. However, the other numbers here, the 6%, 6%, 7%, and so on, th these are pretty significant in the sense that in second grade, less than a third of the students are two or more grade levels below historically, and this fall, almost more than a third are behind. And as you can see, when you look at eighth grade as an example, almost half the students are two or more grade levels below um, their chronological grade. This data I'm sharing with you now represents the state. So as you can see, compared to the nation, New Jersey did a little bit um, not as well. And then the next set of numbers I'm gonna share with you is what the district did. So the district did relatively well in the sense that, yes, there are some students, there's a slight increase in the percentage of students who are two or more grade levels below, but compared to the state and the nation, it is definitely quite an accomplishment to only have a 2% increase, for example, in fourth and fifth grade, where everyone else is 13, seven, eight, um, 16 points difference. So I'm just, quickly doing the math between the gray columns and the pink ones. If I could, Mr. Tam, just remind everyone the situation with eighth grade math, why the numbers are, are what they are, and that's because most of our uh, math students are, are doing uh, was algebra, right? So. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks for letting me um, sharing with the audience. So th this is not tip. This is pretty typical. I know where I, I live in Florida and many of the students in Florida um, who are in eighth grade and they're ready for algebra, they take those algebra courses, the ninth grade content, and it, as a result, do not complete an iReady assessment. And only those who are behind um, complete an iReady assessment. And that's why you see a bit of an increase in grades eight. I don't want to be the eagle eye. So, so the, the third, the series of these slides goes U.S., then New Jersey, then our district, right? So I think this 
third one that you just went over with the math. Oh, it should, should say it district. Should say district of Hudson. Okay, perfect. Yep, sorry. sorry about that. Yep. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Mr. Tim, can you tell us um, how widely iReady is used? What's the, um, what is the data set nationally sure. and within the state? So within the, within nationally about 10 million, within the state of New Jersey, about 175, 175,000 or so. Do you, do, you and, have, do you know how many states, how many districts, et cetera, that kind of thing? Oh uh, yeah. We work with um, across the country. So almost all 50 states. Um, I don't have the exact count for districts, uh, but I just know that as an example, um, the one I was looking, I, I did a presentation earlier for a large urban district. So I memorized the numbers that, for that. And there's an organization called the Council of Great City Schools, so large urban school districts. Uh, we work with 74 out of the 75 large urban school districts. Um, and we, we work with about 40%, they're representing about 40% of all their students. Okay. So across the country, I think there's six, 7,000 districts. I don't have a specific count in terms of how many we work okay. with in the U.S., but. Thank you. No problem. And then just from a percentage perspective, about 10% represents anywhere between 25 to 30% of all um, K through eight students across the United States. So we talked a little bit about math. Um, we're going to talk about reading now. So. I think what's universal about reading, and I think that a lot of the national data shows that too, is that there seems to be less unfinished learning in reading compared to math. I think everyone has different theories related to that, but generally students are much more independent in reading and are, would, would do that. Um, so in the, across the nation, um, there was a you know, five percentage point decrease, and then you start seeing a, a more of a different, um, more unfinished learning in second and third grade. And then in eighth grade, it's interesting um, that it also had a slight decline across the country. This is the numbers for New Jersey. So minus seven across the board, minus seven, 17s, 20s, 19, 21, and 21. So pretty significant in terms of just looking at fifth grade as an example, three quarters of the students were emerging on or above grade level. And now it's just slightly uh, more than half. And this is how the district did. Um, the district started with iReady this fall in grades one and two. So there was no historical comparison. And then there was some data that we had from third through eighth grade um, as to make those comparison points. The one thing I think we, we did notice is that the number of kids who tested is not always the same in both years. So there is some the factor associated with that. But with that in mind, you know, fifth grade actually bucked the trend and they had an in slight increase um, where everyone else was down. And then once again, this is the data from um, the other perspective. When you see, you know, large increases, it's not so good, meaning that historically 20% of the students were two more grade levels below in reading in second grade. Now it's um, 34 and then this is what the data looks like in New Jersey and within the district itself. So seventh grade, I think was one of those two, two, two areas um, in above on emerging on or above and two more grade levels below that had more of a change compared to some of the other grades. Um, I know one, of the addition, one last thing I would just share with you is growth, but before I move on to growth, any final questions for me in regards to reading data? You're asking about competitive um, uh, districts? I couldn't really hear the question, but so, I, 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 I'm guessing it was something along the lines of um, how did other districts do across the country that is similar to yours in terms of um, comparison? Not, not even across the country, just locally. Um, we, we, we tend to benchmark ourselves against uh, a number of districts around the area. And so I think Mr. Brzee is asking if we have that data in comparison. Um, 
for a lot for privacy reasons, we generally don't share any like district specific information, whereas we would aggregate it by nation and New Jersey. I can tell you anecdotally that um, when I look at some of the numbers that, uh, that I'm seeing on the screen, it is actually quite good. Uh, meaning that I, I've, I've spent a lot of time working with a lot of districts um, and I don't see you know, the kind of numbers that your district is generating, especially in having the minimal amount of differences um, in terms of prior history and this fall. So there's definitely some congratulations to you and your teachers in trying to making sure that you know, the, there's as, as less unfinished learning as possible amongst your students. So unlike uh, a state data system, this is a, a private data source, Mr. Brzee. So that's the so the issue we have is they can't release our data to other districts or vice versa. That is something that we give feedback on regularly about uh, that would be a feature that would be very helpful to us um, down the road. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> sorry, we're, we're just changing some microphones, Mr. Kim. Sorry. You're no, saying no it's, it's similar to when Mr. Kim gives us the data on the state level information that where we have the data from the other towns and we don't have that data. Here. That's right. So we don't have that for I ready. Thank you. Sure. I, so the one last thing I'll share uh, before I wrap up for the evening is a lot of districts are interested in understanding how did they grow last year? So what I wanted to do is share with you um, your growth information. But before I do that, I do want to emphasize how our growth model works. So we provide to every single student um, two growth measures, what we call typical and what we call stretch. So typical growth is the average amount of growth of kids like you. And the idea behind typical growth is that it allows you to identify how much growth students need to make in order to keep up in essence. For those students who are behind, um, we also want to provide a growth measure that allows them to catch up or move up. The idea behind catching up is you may start the year in third grade, but um, are placing at a first grade level. What we want to do is make a recommendation of how much growth that student needs to make over time in order to catch up and be on grade level. Or you could have a student who's already on grade level and you want to figure out how much growth they need to aspire to in order to, be on, to get to advanced proficiency so that's what our growth model provides as well. So there are two numbers I'll be sharing with you, typical and stretch. And then we, we report out our data in terms of medians. So for those of us who don't remember our like, um, stats courses, the median represents the middle value. So what we're doing is we compute the amount of growth for every single student. And then we basically looked at the middle. And we would say that the median percent progress is 104. And the reason why we use the median as opposed to the um, average is that the median is less likely to be influenced by outliers. This is one of the reasons why a lot of like economic statistics or even um, census is reported in terms of median family income and household size and so on. So that said, this is your growth data from last year. So the orange bars represents the median percent progress of typical growth achieved. And then the teal bars represents the median percent progress of stretch growth. So overall, the numbers are really good. Um, they're generally over 100%, uh, percent, meaning the median student, or the middle child, grew more than 100% of their typical growth. And then stretch growth, they're well towards, very close towards getting that as well. Okay. So we're not talking of 100% of the kids achieve the goal. We're saying in fourth grade, we are saying that if I were to look at, calculate the median percent progress of every single student, the middle student was 100. So another way of saying it is half the kids got more than 100, half the kids got less than 100 in fourth grade. Um, as a point of reference, um, I was wanted to share with you what growth looks like um, in terms of large school districts. So if you look at these charts, um, they're not scaled evenly, but last year across other school districts, um, they didn't get to 100. They were in, this, in the 70s. So for your district um, in a pandemic to be close to 100 in many of those categories, it's quite remarkable. And the same is true for uh, the, purse, the stretch growth. You were in the 60s, you see the numbers in front of you, they're in the 50s and 40s. So um, growth is different than proficiency. I shared with you the proficiency numbers. Um, this is growth. So growth is great in the sense that 
it allows you to know that even though the students are starting well, starting the year strong, they're maintaining their momentum year after year. So this is the math data, and this is what it looks like in terms of reading. So across reading, um, all the grades except for eight, seven, and eight um, made more than 100% of typical growth as a percent progress. And you can see what it looks like in terms of the 70s for stretch. So this is setting you up in well for the future, um, especially when you compare that to the rest of the country where um, you saw you know, a bit of a change from previous years. So this is once again, the district values uh, for reading. And this is um, the data across the district from pre-COVID to this, co to this year across the large school districts. So generally reading um, you know, did a little bit better. Um, you can see how they did prior to um, COVID, 120 something percent. And then you can see the orange column is this spring. So this is just a different way of looking at data um, from a national perspective where everyone was down last year, but you're up. And then your performance is close to how people did um, before we hit a, we had a pandemic where everyone was growing. Is this, I'm sorry, this slide you're showing now, is that? Uh, what, large school, what, this uh, is um, large school districts. Oh, large school districts. Okay, that's, yep. that's nationally, okay. And then um, the orange or the teal, uh, the, I guess the peach color um, is the spring of 1819. So how much growth achieved in the 1819 school year? And then the orange columns. So the 65, 62, 79 represents how much growth was achieved last spring, last year. And I'm sorry, do you have this slide for our district? Um, I, don't, I don't have historical. Okay. Okay. For your district. I only have last year's um, for your district. Can you show us that? Do you have that or no? Yeah, I, do you? Let me go back. It was only on the screen for a second. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Let me go back a second. So this is, okay. That's uh, this our is math. Yep. This is your district for math. And this is your district for reading. Okay, thank you. And then the other, call, other graphs were for um, large school districts. So last year for typical and stretch, and then this looks, this provides a perspective of how those districts did um, historically and last spring. And unfortunately we don't have your historical information going back to 1819. Any questions from the board? Just a quick one, uh, sorry. Uh, not to delve into this, but if we did choose to, uh, if we shared our data with other districts, can we opt in so that we could see the data that Mr. Breezy was talking about? If, I don't know how many districts in New Jersey you serve, but if we decide, if we said, hey, we're, we'll share our information if you share yours, could would you guys be open to us seeing, I don't know, Livingston or Berkeley Heights or whoever we talk to? Yeah, so what we would probably recommend instead is um, for you to contact the districts directly Okay. Yeah, so sure. what we could do is we, we can we can create the slides for them, and then they can share the information with you directly. That way, we're in the process of just representing the information, and then we're not in, in the awkward position of having to like potentially violate FERPA by no. sharing information with another district. But That's, this is this is not FERPA. I'm sorry. Is know, there so. is there a way to break it down further by county then? Um, because we wouldn't know who in the county. Obviously, if we're the only ones that would come up pretty quickly mm -hmm. I still unmute. um just the next level of detail would be good i think to, to mr bishi's point if our, our data is getting shared at the state and country level um we we should get something in return for that in, in my opinion um mm -hmm. uh, other districts are benefiting from that for those slides i'd like to see something a little bit more finite locally for us even if it's just at a county level i don't i don't need to know what schools but 
county, I think, is a, a next logical step down from the state that would help to differentiate or, or, or validate the numbers for us and how we stand. So food sure. Yeah, no, that, that's definitely worth considering. So I, I guess I can work with uh, uh, Mr. Winnick, um, can make them around, like what are some of the comparison districts that you, you would uh, benchmark yourself against? And then we could um, calculate the numbers and then we're not sharing with you, but you can contact one another um, to exchange information. Or from a county perspective, what are some comparable counties that you would consider yourself as a peer? Okay. Yeah, just want to make sure it's okay by year. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll follow up on that separately. But I, I think that the important part is it's what's the purpose of the assessment. And right now, I think Mr. Tam, what you're hearing is in in a period where we didn't have state data like we normally do, people are trying to fill in the gaps with some kind of comparison information. I think the state information is more helpful, which is why we asked you to come here tonight compared to last month where we could only give our information, which is all on the website for anybody who wants to see last month's presentation as well. Um, but right now there's a dearth of information because the state hasn't published any kind of comparison data. So that's why I think you're hearing those where iReady wasn't, that's not the purpose of iReady. It's not for comparison information. It's just we're using it that way now because we don't have the other information. So we can follow up on that offline. Sounds good. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Tam. Thank, right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have uh, jumbled the uh, agenda slightly. So we're going to go back to uh, Superintendent's remarks. Thank you. I knew we had some presenters with tight schedules, so I asked Mr. Franco to postpone my remarks uh, till now. It doesn't mean I'll talk for half an hour, but uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, several topics, though. I do want to uh, give a huge thank you to our Warren Middle School nurse, Lisa Lantai, our local health official, Kevin Sumner, and our school physician, Dr. Frank, and his staff from Greenbrook Family Medicine. Uh, since our last uh, board meeting, they have delivered adult booster vaccine clinics on November 3rd and pediatric vaccine clinics on November 9th and 16th. We're up to around 300 of our own students who will be completely vaccinated prior to winter break due to just the November uh, clinics. Plus we did a clinic back in June with another 100 plus students. Uh, and beyond that, we know a lot of families chose to uh, get their children vaccinated through their own private providers. Um, <clears throat> while this has not occurred yet, and I wanna make that clear, we do hope that we're going to see information from the state in the near future about what guidance might shift as a result of vaccines being available. I, I understand the governor in some press conferences uh, in the last day or two has made some comments suggesting that maybe in the beginning of January, there'd be information. As I've said throughout the last two years, we tend to get that information the same way everybody else does, a press conference, but uh, we are talking internally to make sure we're ready for whatever that might look like and be, and be ready to respond to it quickly. Uh, for those of you that watch the weekly videos, we went through a really positive period with low COVID rates and very few cases from late October until last week. Unfortunately, the most recent update from the state for our region puts us very close to moving up from yellow to orange, from moderate to high risk. And our local health official reported a significant uptick in Warren Township cases last week, which we also saw in our district. We went from no cases to five in about a 24 hour period. Um, so coming up to Thanksgiving and the holidays, I know none of us wants to live through another holiday season of extreme precautions, but we're all gonna do our part to try to keep our, ourselves safe and everybody else safe so we can keep our students in school. Uh, on the planning for elementary growth topic, we're very grateful to have received 650 responses to our planning for elementary growth survey, which represents more than 50% of the students at each of our elementary schools, which is phenomenal for a survey uh, response rate and additional community members who don't have elementary school children. That includes parents of children zero to five who would be affected down the road by any decisions, as well as parents of middle school students who might have you know, reflection based on their own experiences and community members without kids in the district. Uh, the district committee charged with investigating this topic and bringing a recommendation to the board. Uh, and you heard from Mr. Villar about the kind of processes we work. That committee is meeting tomorrow afternoon. One of their primary goals tomorrow is to review the community survey results. And the raw information from the community survey will be posted on the district website next week. And there will be an update posted in next week's community briefing about the progress made. So all the raw data will be available. There is a link on the main website now for this topic. Uh, on the theme of community engagement, I also want to report that our strategic plan, stakeholder voice and engagement committee will meet on December 1st. This is a group of parents, staff members, administrators, and board members. It meets periodically 
to get input on each of the district goals. And you can see those on the end of the agenda. Uh, there are subcommittees for each of those district goals. We started that process last year with the implementation of the strategic plan. And that's how we kind of prioritize which things should be in each year. So that committee is meeting on December 1st. Uh, I echo Mr. Franco and congratulating our new board members who were able to be here ahead of tonight's meeting to do a little bit of orientation. Uh, we're very excited to welcome you to the dais in just a couple of meetings. We're happy you're here tonight as well. I want to remind the community that we do have a referendum on the ballot on December 14th, Monday, December 14th, that has zero, uh, it's a zero debt referendum, no tax impact. The polls will be open from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. that day. Mail-in ballots can also be requested. I believe that the mail-in ballots for people who already requested might even be home by now for people. They, they were going out at the end of last week. Um, please watch your sample ballots carefully because there will be some changes to polling places from where you voted in the November general election. So there are some consolidation of polling places because turnout tends to be lower. Uh, so just watch carefully to make sure you know where you go for your polling place and we hope everybody participates. There is a district website on the referendum with all the details of the projects. And if I haven't said it enough, there's no impact on the tax levy. We hope everybody goes out and votes on December 14th. So can we, uh, is there a site to the district So the, uh, I don't think there's a link to the maps because I don't know that we know for sure where they finalize the point locations, but we can try to add that. Once we get it, we'll, we'll make it available. Thank you. We don't have it yet. Thank you. Uh, I also want to mention that um, two things related to the Lions Club. Each year, the Lions, Cl Lions Clubs from around the world sponsor the Lions International Peace Poster Contest in local schools and youth groups. This is an art contest that encourages young people to express their visions of peace. As she does each year, Dr. Cooper, Mar Middle School staff member, coordinated submissions from the district. Four of our students were ultimately submitted for regional consideration. Lilla Bellish, Kayla Peng, Clara Risso, and Emily Wang. Congratulations to Clara Risso, whose poster won first prize in the local contest and second prize in the regional contest of all Lions Clubs in our region. So congratulations to Dr. Cooper and all of those students. Uh, I'd also like to thank Mr. Brzee, who, for as he has done for the last five or so years, probably, served as our, our liaison between the district and the Lions Club uh, as we help connect Thanksgiving dinners that the Lions Club helps put together with families who could use a little support this time of the year. Uh, Mr. Brzee picks up the collection that winds up going out to district families and then brings them to each school. And I appreciate you doing that for us again. We're, we're a very small part of what is a massive effort by the Lions Club and importantly of the Leo's Club, which is the, uh, which is the, the youth group program within the Lions Club. Uh, recent reporting said that this year there was 270 plus Thanksgiving baskets. So, uh, you know, really great um, to be able to help support that. Uh, in closing, I'd like to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. I know that I have a lot to be thankful for this Thanksgiving. I think we all do. Um, not least of which is the opportunity to do the work that we do together. Uh, I hope that everybody in the community has a chance to take a breath and relax a little bit during the Thanksgiving break. Uh, and then as we come back for December and, and going into the holiday season uh, on what I think we should consider to have been a very successful first three months of the school year, uh, getting as closer to normal. And we all hope that will be even closer uh, when we come back in January. Uh, just to close out my comments in the holiday spirit, I would mention that on Saturday, November 13th, the middle school chorus under the direction of Mrs. Amy Jensen performed at Bridgewater Commons Mall and we have a short clip of that performance for the board. <laughs> Here's what the big was.
The Finance Operations and Security Committee met on Monday, November 15th, a, a lighter agenda, which is normal as we kind of wind down the calendar year. Items we discussed uh, included um, funding for events that previously may have been sponsored by the PTO and reviewing those. We also discussed a um, bus safety public service announcement based on some feedback that we have received. We did review at a high level the, the uh, proposed budget calendar for uh, next fiscal year. There's a link in the minutes. I don't wanna go into details, but I would encourage everyone to look at that. That's an important one, especially as we look forward to the, um, the board meetings next year. We did review the referendum project update, including um, our, our long-term capital plan that we've had in place for many years. Uh, as, as well as I would have mentioned the opportunity for a zero tax impact <laughs> upcoming on December 14th, for the benefit of all. And we wrapped up with a township subcommittee update from Mrs. Zahn and myself. Our next meeting is scheduled for December 13th at 6 p.m. Uh, yep, so the ad hoc return to school committee met, I kind of summarized there. There's not any real policy level changes at this point, um, just that we are constantly evaluating and reevaluating our practices, watching the, the data carefully, and just trying to be uh, in the right place for when more local discretion comes, which we hope is going to be in the relatively near future. Um, and as I said earlier, we're a little bit concerned that the numbers went in the wrong direction. We, we had been planning because it seemed like we were on the verge of going to green and then it just flipped all in a week. So unfortunately we're sort of in pause right now. Okay, thanks Dr. Mingo. Uh, other committee reports? I don't believe okay, moving on to public commentary. This is for agenda items only. This is the first of two public commentary sections. Uh, again, it's for agenda items. You have three minutes. Uh, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. I will call on you in the order when your hand is raised. Please state your name and address um, before you make your statement. Or in person. Or in person. <laughs> yes, we have in person guests. Anybody wish to make a public comment? Again, I Okay, seeing no hands. Species. Um, does anybody like to pull, I know item B, B1, we're gonna pull for separate vote. Is there anything else anyone would like to pull for separate vote or discussion on the agenda? And that's all of B1? No. This, 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 this I think it's just a specific policy. Uh, 5751, I think. Okay. Uh, motion to approve items for board consideration A1 through A3, B1 through B8, C1 through C15, 
and D1 with the exception of P and R5751. Second. Mr. Bellish? Yes. Mr. Bishi? Yes. Mr. Breezy? Yes. Mrs. Clark? Yes. Ms. Keller? Yes. Mr. Weinstein? Yes. Mrs. Zahn? Yes. And Mr. Franco? Yes. Motion passes 8 0. And motion to approve item for board consideration D1 uh, policy PR 5751. Mr. Bellish? Yes. Mr. Bishi? Yes. Mr. Breezy? Yes. Mrs. Clark? Yes. Ms. Ms. Keller? Yes. Mr. Weinstein? Yes. Mrs. Zahn? Yes. And Mr. Franco? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, moving on to unfinished business. Do we have any? Board members, I'm just busy seeing none. Moving to new business, uh, I would uh, like permission to create a ad hoc uh, committee to um, be liaison with the uh, elementary growth uh, planning committee. Does anyone like to discuss or have objection? Go for it, Mark. <laughs> Motion to create a ad, ad hoc committee uh, with respect to the planning for elementary growth. Mr. Yep. Mr. Bellish. Yes. Mr. Bishi. Yes. Mr. Breezy. Yes. Mrs. Clark. Ms. Keller? Yes. Mr. Weinstein? Yes. Ms. Mrs. Zahn? Yes. And Mr. Franco? Yes. Motion passes 8 0. Okay. This is the second of two public commentary sections. Same rules apply as the first. Please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom or feel free to step up in person. I'm sorry, Kevin Brotsby's. Yes, Kevin Brotsby's Eight Snyder Road. Um, and my my comment is more of a question um, for those board members who will be continuing on the board in the new year. Um, I would, I would respectfully ask if you would um, advise whether you are prepared to accept the uh, strategic growth committee's uh, recommendation um, without question, or if you're prepared to uh, debate the uh, recommendation that's made. Thank you. I don't think anyone's gonna to respond to that, but uh, anything that comes to the board will be debated before it is voted. Mr. Jones. Hi, everyone. Wish I could be there in person. Uh, <laughs> I'm on dad duty, though. Um, so I am uh, PJ Jones, Vice President of the Warren Township Education Association. I'd like to take a moment just to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Um, in my house, we have a Thanksgiving tradition of each member of the family sharing something they're thankful for from that year. I'd like to share my gratitude with the Board of Education and the community in attendance. First, I'm thankful for the first responders, many of them union members, including healthcare professionals, police, firefighters, essential employees, and especially teachers like my fellow WTEA members who have been on the job and in person during the past 20 months. Each of them risked their own safety and the safety of their families to do necessary work and look out for the most vulnerable members of our society. 
I'm thankful to the members of the Board of Education who have devoted their time and energy, free of charge and far from free of criticism, to do a public service for this community. I'm extremely thankful and appreciative of the sacrifices made by our outgoing Board of Ed officials who help navigate a complex and constantly changing situation with grace and civility. I encourage the incoming members of the board to follow in their footsteps and make decisions carefully with the greater good always in mind. The WTEA will be here to work side by side with you as we have with them to keep Warren schools among the best in the nation. I'm thankful for the community of Warren for trusting us with the care of the most precious things in your lives, your children. We're extremely fortunate to teach some of the kindest, most curious and enthusiastic learners on the planet. And I know that many of my colleagues wake up every day, usually after a cup of coffee or two, and look forward to coming to work in this fine school district. The outpouring of support from caring parents throughout the last year and a half made a huge difference to us as your children's teachers. When I consider all that I have to be thankful for this year, I'm filled with gratitude. And with this gratitude comes hope. I hope that one day soon we can go about our day without constantly being reminded of COVID's presence. I hope that your children and my own are more resilient and appreciative for what they have as a result of having gone through this. I hope that we realize as a species that we're better off when we work together. And I hope that we all try to live our lives more fully in honor of those lives who were cut short. I ask that we take this moment as an opportunity to look out for each other, treat each other a little better and show our children how amazing this world can be when we respect one another. Let's rise above our differences and our differences of opinion and remember that we're all here for the same reason. We want what's best for your kids. Please get your children vaccinated if they're able so we can return to normalcy safely and quickly. And I challenge everyone here to take the first step in making our interactions with each other a little bit better. Happy Thanksgiving from the WTEA. Thank you very much, Mr. Jones. Uh, seeing no more hands raised, uh, that brings an end to public commentary. Whereas the Open Public Meetings Act, NJSA 10.4-11, permits the Board of Education to meet in closed session to discuss certain matters. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Education adjourns to closed session to discuss pending or anticipated litigation or contract negotiation and or matters of attorney-client privilege. Action will not be taken upon return to public session. The length of the meeting is anticipated to be approximately 20 minutes and be it further resolved, the minutes of this closed session be made public when the need for confidentiality no longer exists. Second. All board members, all those in favor of going to executive session, so aye. 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 All those opposed? Motions? The board is now in executive session.
Okay, motion to resume public session. Second. Board members, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention. We are now back in public. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.